So the NBA decided to make some big changes with their new CBA agreement and I want to talk about it in today's video. I was originally going to post a main channel video about it, but ultimately I felt like I missed the wave to actually make the video when the news was fresh. So I'm talking about it a week later to you now. <laughs> That's essentially what's going on. Subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, nearly at 100k, so that subscription is seriously much appreciated. Also drop a like, it only takes one second and makes a massive difference on how the video performs in the YouTube algorithm. But for today's video, I want to talk about these rule changes and the um, way that they're going to shape the future of the NBA. The first things first, I should throw out there that the fact that a negotiation even happened without a lockout to begin with is pretty great because a lot of us, I think reasonably so, we're predicting that there would be a lockout coming up with this new CBA negotiation because in the last few years, let's be frank, players have gotten a little fast and loose with the whole uh, player empowerment thing. Me personally, I don't care. I like, um, I still think player empowerment should be progressing even further. But at least as far as NBA owners are concerned, at least as far as a lot of fans have felt, uh, felt like there would be a attempt to push back at that from the powers that be on the NBA side of thing to kind of try and make the NBA players be quote unquote like in check. That didn't end up happening obviously. They managed to come to mutual terms which is good for everybody in the NBA world. I'm glad it didn't happen but I was really surprised that it did not happen so got to give them credit for that. But there's really two main facets in this. I guess there's three. There is there were cap stuff limitations for like adding players based on luxury tax. I don't know the exact details of it, but it would mean moves like I believe Dante DiVincenzo to the Warriors last year wouldn't have been able to happen given these new rules. Like I think it's teams that are super high on the payroll don't have an exception to sign players that they used to. The mid-level exception is what it's related to maybe. I don't know the details of that cap stuff always makes my brain hurt because I'm bad with money as me, let alone imagining managing that much money just gives me anxiety. But the two things that are important to me is the changes for award voting and of course the uh, regular season tournament. So first let me address the regular season tournament. I feel like people being really negative about it are like viewing it as though it's some big deal and I really don't think it is given that it ultimately is going to ultimately result in one more game played in the regular season for two different teams obviously because you need two of them um, but 83 games played by two teams is not that consequential to players health of course we'd like to see less games rather than more but it's not like it was some huge leap um and with that how much the players will care obviously we don't know but even if it doesn't go well it's not set up in a way that i think is detrimental to the rest of the regular season i don't think people will value it that significantly i don't think it's a big deal uh i don't think that highly of it either on the same end of that spectrum i don't think it's going to be some big success i think the play-in has had mixed reviews for the most part i lean more positive but there's been things about it that have been negative i think this year the play-in tournament's overall going to get a positive review though because there's a lot of teams that are interesting actually playing and with some good stuff on the line um but in general uh plans had a mixed review I think this will probably have mixed reviews as well, and that'll be it. I don't really care that much, though. I understand it's a big deal, but if it goes poorly, then it's not a big deal. If it goes great, then it's an extra good thing, and that's obviously good. Uh, on the other side of the things, though, the award voting. They added some rules and stipulations that are things that I just feel are common sense and should have been the way should have been this way from the very onset so they added a limitation for i don't know what if it was all the nba awards or just the mvp or a good chunk of them i think this is the case as well for all nba teams so it's definitely more than just the mvp all nba teams all defensive teams uh those things positionless from here on out after this year's all nba teams we're getting positionless all nba teams for the remaining seasons presumably for the rest of nba history now I understand why this was a complicated issue to some people, why they didn't want this to change, because the idea of, you know, 
a basketball team is a point guard, a shooting guard, a small forward, a power forward, a center. That traditional view set has always existed there, and even as things have become more flexible, there's still like guards, wings, and centers, ultimately. Um, sometimes you're not playing with centers, sometimes you're playing five wings out there because you're the Toronto Raptors. But in general, uh, even though positionless has become more of a thing, it's also not... Um, to the degree that I think some stat nerds will act like it is. Like, ultimately, still need usually two forwards, two guards, and a center. Most teams are rocking that type of configuration in a traditional sense. I'm not just talking like a small forward who's playing shooting guard. Like, shooting guard, shooting guards, you know, for the most part. You get what I mean, hopefully. Or you don't. Whatever. But it wasn't even about that. Really, to me, the All-NBA teams are recognizing the best talent in the league. And in years like when DeAndre Jordan is all NBA first team, it feels like a gross mix mischaracter miss Jesus Christ. A gross mischaracterization of who the top talents in the league are. Now I understand it's not necessarily supposed to be viewed that way, but it's the way that it typically is. And an all NBA first team selection can like really bolster an NBA career. It's a bigger deal than a second or third team that, like jo Joel Embiid, has gotten a bunch of second teams and will probably get, well, I guess he might win MVP this year. Who's going to get second team between him and Jokic? One of those two, though, is going to get second team. So either way, uh, that's the problem. And I think it's a little ridiculous that that has persisted for so long, especially as the game becomes less position-oriented. Again, it's not as... Uh, black and white of uh, used to be all about positions and now positionless as some present it. There's still a lot of gray area in there, but we have moved past viewing the game and in, in such a binary way, so strict to the concept of positions that I think it's well worth viewing it differently and just making the top five players in the league, the all NBA first team next five guys, second team next five guys, third team. You get it. Same goes for defensive players. Sometimes, you know, the for like all NBA teams, sometimes the th three of the best players are all guards and those players should all make that team. You know, to me, I'm pretty radical with it. If the top 15 players in the league were all point guards, obviously that would never happen. But let's just say that's the world we live in. Uh, there are 15 teams with the top 15 players in the league and all of them are point guards. If that was the case, the all NBA teams should be four, should be 15 point guards. That's how radical I am with it. And I'm glad that the NBA left it to be open to those types of things rather than making like, you know, center forward more blurry or whatever, as some people suggested that also would have worked, but I think we should look at it in the spirit of just who's the best basketball players and positions did not determine that. Um, the, 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 the minutes or the, the, the games played limitation. Um, I think that's the right way to go. It's something that kind of always subconsciously existed. And I think in general, it is best if you have an unwritten rule to make it a written rule just for the sake of everybody else not being annoyed with it. Because when people talk about unwritten rules, it's like, okay, but it's not actually written. So who gives a fuck about that rule? Maybe write it down. In this case, a 65 game limit, I think is perfectly valid. There are very few, if any, I think there are a few that were talked about, but not a lot of people who have won MVP or DPOY without having played at least 65 games in that regular season or a proportionate amount of those games in a lockout season or a shortened season or whatever. But yeah, um, I think those changes are great. I think the tournament in the regular season could be cool, ultimately inconsequential if it's not. And as for the stopping, you know, rich teams from getting richer, I understand the principle. I understand both sides where some people are like, why are you punishing owners for being willing to spend money on their team? But also owners who don't have cash, like the Warriors owner uh, being like, hey, it's kind of unfair that guy gets to spend so much freaking money because I can't afford that. I get both sides. Ultimately, I'm kind of fence sitting on that one. So, yeah. That's my thoughts on these changes. I think they were ultimately positive and really the positive is that there was uh, no lockout. So yeah, shout out to Rudy for editing this video and goodbye.